And so usually people that want to fight and the end like all the bullies and things that they're concentrating on now, these people have some deep-seated insecurity and they're, they're trying to prove how strong they are. Hello, everyone. It's episode 104 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Sensei Ashita Kim. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best martial arts podcast. I'd like to personally welcome you. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm Whistlekick's founder and very fortunate to be your host here on Martial Arts Radio. Thank you to the returning listeners, and hello and welcome to those of you listening for the first time. If you're new to the show, or you're just not familiar with what we make, check out all the great t-shirts we offer. From comfortable to functional, there's something for everyone. You can find them at whistlekick.com. If you're interested in our sparring gear, which is the heart of what we offer, you can find that there too, or at amazon.com. If you want the show notes, including links and photos, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you're not on the newsletter list, now's a perfect time. We offer exclusive content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. We only email a few times a month. We will never, ever sell or give away your information, and sometimes we mail out a coupon. Here on episode 104, we have Sensei Ashita Kim. One of the early pioneers of ninjutsu in America, Sensei Kim's history weaves itself into many stories you likely already know and involves quite a few martial arts legends. His is a well-known name and one that martial arts historians may have quite a bit to say about. Sensei Kim was very open with his stories, and I had a great time talking to him. Let's welcome him to the show. Sensei Kim, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Uh, Thank you so much for having me today. I uh, really enjoy uh, talking on the radio and talking to people uh, about martial arts, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to do so. Well, thank you for honoring us by coming on. It's going to be a lot of fun, and and I'm sure we're going to get into some, some good stuff and we always do. So that, that's that's why I like doing this, right? I got I have the best job in the world. Great. So before we go too deep, you know, we always like to get context for our guests. So why don't you go way back? Tell us how you got started in the martial arts. Uh, well, uh, my father was in the army uh, when I was growing up, and uh, most every one of the army bases that we uh, were posted at uh, had some sort of a, of a judo club for the soldiers that like to practice judo or, or train in judo. And um, I used to, uh, when I was uh, 8 or 10 years old, I used to go down to uh, the movie theaters every Saturday morning and watch the movie serials and the cartoon features and everything. On the Army Post, it was about 15 cents, so it was, it was a great bargain at the time. And uh, one day, uh, I heard a bunch of noise and everything coming out of some of the uh, wooden buildings that I was passing by. And I decided to go and investigate that, and I spotted my first judo class. And I just kind of stood there at the door in awe, watching these guys throw each other around and, and uh, do different techniques on each other. And after that, I didn't go to the movies anymore. I just I would just come down and watch these guys work out on Saturday morning. And, of course, being 8 or 10 years old and these guys being professional soldiers, they really didn't have a lot of time to pay attention to me. So I just, like I said, I learned a lot from just watching them. And every once in a while, kind of like with the Shaolin experience, they'd let me sweep up the floor or show me a couple of falls and this kind of thing. And um, one of the things that I was most fascinated by was the idea that these guys could, could choke each other out and be completely unconscious and then, and then wake each other back up. And uh, that uh, kind of set me on the, on the idea of, of the health aspects as well as the martial arts aspects of of uh, judo and, and later on other martial arts. Back in those days, judo was about the only thing you could study. And uh, later on, uh, uh, when I was in high school, uh, I, I was on the wrestling team in high school. We didn't have a, a very long-lived wrestling team because it was a very small school. But uh, I enjoyed wrestling and picked up some techniques there. And then uh, when I was at uh, college, uh, a friend of mine asked me to go to a, a karate demonstration with him one, one night, and we went over and we watched the demonstration, and we decided that we'd sign up, and that's when I started studying Shotokan uh, as a as my initial martial art, a real martial art. And uh, then as time went on, uh, I learned more uh, systems and techniques and whatnot. And, and uh, when I went to Chicago uh, and met Count Dante, then I learned uh, some, some of the real Kung Fu at that time, which in the 60s, Kung Fu was practically unheard of still. And so... Uh, but uh, getting into the uh, Black Dragon Fighting Society is one of the ways that you learn uh, a lot of the uh, uh, dem muck or death touch techniques, and you learn a lot of the healing techniques as well. 
And so um, I said that's when I started studying a variety of martial arts and, and I really began to explore uh, some of the Chinese systems and, and uh, get into acupuncture and, and uh, that sort of thing. And so uh, it's uh, kept me entertained for quite a long time now. So And uh, there's always something new to learn. So, uh, so I'm constantly uh, uh, picking up new techniques and going to people's seminars and trying different uh, uh, styles and, and weapons and things like that. Uh, and you know, practicing these uh, uh, different uh, uh, systems, so they get a, a better overview of, of how uh, all this developed, and and uh, and uh, have a good uh, philosophical understanding of it as well. So, so you brought up the idea of the healing side of martial arts, and it's interesting that over the last few weeks, we've had a few people on the show that have either brought that up or have made that their profession, right? And it's something that we don't talk about a lot in the martial arts, that there is the flip side to that coin. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you might offer us your thoughts. Well, uh, when I first started taking martial arts, uh, we did a lot of exercises like meditation and, and yoga type stretching exercises and things like this. And, and one of them was like, it was called the eight pieces of brocade, which is a very ancient, um, uh, health and longevity system. And there's only eight exercises, but it, it basically works on the eight psychic channels of the, of the body. And the psychic channels are, are the deep rivers of energy that flow through the body, just like the acupuncture meridians are the, are the, uh, superficial rivers of the body. And so, uh, the eight psychic channels connect the four C's of the body and, uh, and which I like energy and, and uh, blood and marrow and things like this. And so uh, by keeping these channels open, uh, you can maintain uh, good health and, and achieve longevity. And plus some of these exercises also uh, help you to develop uh, what's known as iron body so that you can uh, take uh, uh, impact and, and not be seriously hurt. Uh, uh, Bob Wall, who was in uh, The End of the Dragon with Bruce Lee, was, uh, was somebody who practiced a lot of the... Uh, hard style uh, iron body techniques, and there's a lot of uh, video of him uh, having two by fours broken over his arms and and uh, breaking bricks with his fist and this kind of thing. And uh, uh, the idea then is to be able to, uh, when you disrupt somebody else's energy, uh, is to be able to restore that balance so that they're not permanently injured. Uh, a lot of sport martial arts uh, use a closed fist as a, as a, as a striking technique. Because when you use your open hand, you can actually transmit energy into the person's body and, and cause serious internal damage that's not even really noticed on the outside. This is one of the things that, that Hanshi Dukes, uh, uh, when he did the bottom brick break in the, in the movie Bloodsport, was trying to illustrate was the fact that you can hit somebody and not leave a mark on the outside of their body, and, but still do damage to an internal organ. And... Uh, uh, Earl Montague was one of the pioneers of this sort of thing from Australia. Uh, he wrote the Encyclopedia of Dem Muck, which is a, a very comprehensive uh, uh, work on acupuncture and, and the death touch. And he gives the antidotes to all of the techniques that he has in his book, as well as how to strike them, how to strike the various points, which angle to use, and uh, whether you're exhaling or inhaling, and this sort of, and, and this sort of thing to uh, to um, uh, overcome your opponent with as least uh, damage as possible. Uh, breaking bones, breaking elbows and knees and things like that. Those are more found. Those those type of techniques are more commonly found in the hard style martial arts like the Okinawan systems and, and uh, Taekwondo and things like this. Whereas uh, the more uh, subtle Chinese systems like Baguan, Sing Yi, they rely on the idea of using the fingertip pressure to uh, unbalance the enemy and, and uh, overcome him without, uh, without having to cause any permanent um, physical damage. Um, and all these things are uh, uh, also described in several. One of the masters that I had in the Black Dragon Society was uh, Lawrence Day, who was one of Cal Dante's original students up in uh, Chicago. And we did a book for him called uh, The Poison Hand, in which he uh, showed 77 techniques and the antidotes for each one of those techniques. In, in Montague's book, a couple of times, there are a couple of places where he says there is no antidote for this technique, but there are antidotes for the techniques, even, that, even the ones that he described. Uh, it's just a matter of, of knowing enough of the uh, uh, 
uh, acupuncture systems and the acupressure systems in order to be able to restore the balance, which is essentially the, the key to all of this stuff is, is to have balance. It's kind of like Mr. Miyagi said in The Karate Kid, balance is lesson for whole life, and it applies to everything. And so uh, the, uh, the idea of unbalancing the opponent as a way of taking him down or, or defeating him in, in competition, and then the idea of restoring his balance so that you, you still remain friends and can train together uh, is uh, something, like I said, that comes even from those earliest judo classes that I watched because all of those guys knew each other, they all trusted each other, and, and they were you know, willing to uh, experiment on each other with different techniques and, and find out what worked and what didn't work. And, and uh, uh, so they developed a really uh, elaborate and, and uh, efficient system of uh, martial arts. And most of these martial arts, like the hard styles and things like that, also have healing techniques in their system if you get far enough up into the system. When you get above third degree black belt uh, in most of these styles, they start teaching their resuscitation techniques and things like this. And uh, and you learn how to uh, uh, fix a broken nose or a broken finger, which are fairly common injuries in, in martial arts schools. And uh, and then you start finding out that you can, you can fix other things and uh, and then you, essentially, uh, the older you get, or the most of the people that I've known uh, in martial arts, as, as they get older, they concentrate more and more on the idea of healing the other person than than the idea of hurting them. And so, um, uh, some people spend a lot of time trying to uh, uh, make up for karma that they've caused by hurting other people. Because in as, in martial arts, you go through several different stages as you develop, and at, and at one point almost inevitably, you come to the to the realization that you're a, a, a serious warrior and that you can actually hurt people. And at that point, you have to be very careful not to become a bully and uh, uh, and use your, your powers and your and your techniques to, uh, to uh, impose your will on people. And after you get past that stage, then you, when you realize that you can't actually hurt people, after you get past that stage, you realize that you don't want to hurt people, that you want to actually help them. And so uh, a lot of times that's when people start getting into teaching and start getting into the, into the medical techniques. And, and uh, I have several friends that uh, started out in, in uh, martial arts, uh, one of, in Kempo, who uh, has a clinic now and, and uh, does uh, all sorts of uh, uh, techniques in terms of, he doesn't do any acupuncture techniques, but he uses uh, acupuncture points or acupressure points uh, to help people uh, get over things. And he's uh, actually uh, cured quite a few people that I'm aware of. Uh, in one of his cases, uh, there was a lady that was going to the Moffitt Cancer Center over in Tampa, and uh, she had brain cancer. And the doctor said, well, there's nothing we can do for you. That We've done everything we know. And uh, so one of her doctors had heard of this friend of mine and suggested that she go see him and uh, not tell him, what was going on or anything, just to go and visit with him and see what was see what he could do for her. And uh, he did his diagnostic techniques on her, and he told her, he said, well, there's a little something going on in, in your head here. Let me work on that. And so she came back for like three treatments and uh, using energy techniques and, and uh, systems like Reiki and Shiatsu and things like this. And uh, after about a month or so, she went back to the cancer center and they, they x-rayed her and whatnot, and there was no more brain cancer there. And so... Uh, then, uh, so like I said, they didn't believe that it actually had worked, but uh, but she did fairly well for quite a long time after that. And so, uh, and I've there was another uh, patient of his uh, from Arizona that had a 35 pound uh, tumor in his uh, in his abdomen, and uh, over a period of about a year, uh, they took care of that and got rid of that. And so, and the doctors, of course, wanted to operate and and uh, you know do all the surgery and put him on chemo and all this kind of stuff and wasn't really necessary. It just took a little bit more to do it, a little bit longer to do it with the uh, with the energy techniques and the herbs and things like that. So, um, like I said, I've known several martial artists that are that are at that level that are uh, you know able to to do uh, amazing things in the, in the healing systems and and uh, so and of course, like I said, they're they're very happy to do that because they um, uh, they understand that that's the real uh, the real art and. Like when I was studying ninjutsu, um, the, one of the first things they told me was that the, the system that I studied uh, came from uh, a place called Koka City in uh, in Japan, which was north of Tokyo, about uh, 40 miles or so by train. And it was always known as the city of medicine. 
because they grew mugwort and they did uh, moxibustion and healing techniques like this. And when the, the shogun decided he was going to wipe out all these people in these two pre, uh, provinces because uh, they were ninjas and he was afraid they were going to try to overthrow him, uh, the doctors and the healers, not wanting to hurt anybody, they developed a system of martial arts that was that was essentially nonviolent, which is the ninjutsu system that I practice. And the and the principle of that is basically to throw sand in their eyes so that you can't see you for a second, and then run away so you don't have to hurt anybody. And uh, and that's where the whole ninjutsu invisibility uh, system came from. And and uh, uh, so uh, they said that way there's nobody. Uh, if there's only one person. It's hard for one person to have a fight. It takes two people to tango, and so um, I said, if you if you know that you can hurt the other guy, then proving it is irrelevant because you know you can do it, and, and you don't have to show it. You don't have to prove it to anybody else. And so usually, people that want to fight at the end, like all the bullies and things that they're concentrating on now, these people have some deep seated insecurity, and they're they're trying to prove how strong they are, and. Uh, that's pretty much a useless um, uh, endeavor because every time I thought that I was really bad and was and was a super fighter and could beat anybody up, usually somebody came along and showed me that I wasn't so bad and that I could be beat up myself and and I better learn to be be a little bit more humble and so uh, that's usually what happens with bullies too. Sooner or later, they run up against somebody that uh, explains to them in no uncertain terms that their behavior is inappropriate and it's not going to be tolerated. And so, uh, so this is something you go through in martial arts. You learn these lessons, and, and there's a lot of there's a lot of hidden lessons in martial arts. Uh, uh, even in the in the katas and things that people practice, there there are uh, very subtle techniques in some of these forms that that most people are not even aware of. And most people, especially in in America, don't put a lot of confidence or or have, spend a lot of time practicing kata because they think it's just a dull, boring exercise. But if they get into it far enough, they realize that in the kata there's also secrets of where the pressure points are, how to tie, how to strike the pressure points, and also sometimes how to avoid being struck on those pressure points. So it's uh, it's a very complicated system. Uh, it's uh, like when I first started studying acupuncture or acupressure, uh, they told me there were 365 points. You had to know each point. You had to know which uh, whether to needle them counterclockwise or counter or clockwise. And uh, and went on and on. It got very complicated. But eventually, uh, I, I came across a, a teacher who was able to tell me that there's there's only 12 meridians, and if you know which way they're flowing, then you know which way to needle the, the meridian to cause which effect you want. Uh, and so it uh, then it was fairly easy to to uh, understand the system. Once you understand the principles, uh, then it's it's fairly easy to understand the system as opposed to. Uh, having you learn each one of these 365 points uh, individually, and and uh, it's a tremendous memorization exercise uh, uh, to do that. And uh, but uh, they said, and then all of that also relates to the five elements, because uh, uh, if uh, if you understand what the, how the five elements work in the body, the different cycles that they have, then it's it's uh, even easier to unbalance the opponent than it is if you if you only know the acupuncture points. So, but the the healing arts are, uh, uh, in my opinion, the uh, the, the top level of, uh, of martial arts. And uh, most of the people that I know that are above uh, seventh or eighth degree uh, very seldom engage in any competition. They just they just try to uh, uh, teach other people uh, these various life lessons and the techniques, and and uh, and they spend most of their time. Uh, helping other people, you know, to to be better and to and to learn about themselves, because much of this is is involved in self knowledge, and when you understand yourself, then you understand pretty much everybody else too, because most people are pretty much the same, and uh, uh, so like I said, when you understand that why the other person wants to fight you, then a lot of times you can talk him out of it, or you can overcome him and prevail without having to uh, to do some kind of serious damage to him, so. That makes a lot of sense, and and I like some of the things that you were saying in there around the simplicity and and the progression, you know, kind of through you know just I I had this almost um, parallel in my mind as we were talking about the the way training goes, you know, people start and 
it, for them, it's about, it's about combat and it's about fighting. It's about competition. And then you reach a point where, as you said, you realize that there's always going to be somebody that's a better fighter than you. There's always someone that can prove to you that you're not so bad. Right. Right. But you get to a point where you realize, you know, this isn't necessarily what it's even about. Right. And it's about that. Well, self growth. When I was at uh, they told me they said sooner, uh, eventually, when you stay in this long enough, you'll be able to look at somebody and you'll know what style they're going to they're going to use just by looking at their stance and 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 how they hold their hands and stuff. And uh, I thought that was, of course, impossible. But uh, uh, over the years, uh, I've managed to to develop that that sense uh, of of when you see your opponent, you see how he's standing, you've got a pretty good idea of what he's going to do. It's just uh, uh, just based on his, his stance and, and whether he's grounded or not, which is another interesting aspect of all of this, is the idea of, of being grounded and rooted to the earth and being able to draw energy from the earth uh, to do these different healing techniques and things like that. Uh, uh, most of these systems don't, don't really teach what we call grounding or rooting to the, to the, to the earth, uh, but that's you know, the, the, one of the essential parts of, of doing the, uh, the energy techniques. So it's, uh, but you know, it's like I said, it, it, a lot of it depends on where your teacher is. If you, if your teacher is into the competition, he's going to teach you competition techniques. And, and if he's into healing, he'll teach you healing techniques. And, uh, then the other part of that is, is, is uh, whether or not they're very commercial because most of the commercial schools teach you like one technique every three months. And so you have to keep coming back for a long, long time to learn the whole system. And of course you have to keep paying dues for all of that. Whereas, uh, uh these techniques like in ninjutsu, the idea of throwing sand in a guy's eyes, anybody can learn that in five seconds. And so it's it's a system of self-defense that you can learn very quickly and that you can use very effectively in almost every situation, and it doesn't take you forever to learn it. And, uh, and of course, right. once you throw sand in a guy's eyes, you don't have to run away. You can pick up a brick and bash him in the head if you want. It's just a question, and that gives you the, the power that you, that you your, the empowerment technique that you that you need to feel like you can defend yourself, and so um, uh, there's a really good movie one time called Enough with with Jennifer Lopez where she was an abused wife, and she went and took lessons from a martial artist in the in the film, and and at one point he told her he says okay, this is the technique that you use when he's sitting on your chest choking you to death, and and she said well that's not going to happen because I know all these other techniques, and he said yes but you don't have the heart, okay, you don't you don't have the will. To, to hurt this guy, no matter what you say and no matter how hard you train, you don't have the will to hurt him. So at some point, when you confront him, he's going to have you on the ground, he's going to sit on your chest, and he's going to be choking the life out of you. This is how you get out of it. And sure enough, that's what happened in the movie. And this is, even though it's a movie, it, it, it's the parallel in real life that that most people do not want to hurt other people. Uh, in, uh, in the movie uh, Men Who Stare at Goats, they talked uh, about a study that the Army did. It said most soldiers in their first combat experience will aim high and, and not intentionally try to shoot the enemy because they don't really want to hurt anybody. After they've been shot at a few times and after they've seen their buddies get killed all around them, then they're willing to, sh- to kill the enemy. But even after all the training that they go through in basic training and AIT and things like this, most people still do not have that attitude of, of wanting to hurt the enemy. And uh, it's, right. it's a particular mindset that you have to develop. And, uh, and like I said, in martial arts, this develops when you get to the point where you feel like you can hurt these people. And then, and which is, like I said, and then you get to the point where you decide you don't want to. So it's, uh, uh, it's a very, uh, martial arts is, is a lifelong experience, and I, I've been very lucky to, uh, to have uh, enjoyed as much of it as I have. So um, it's, he like said, and I, I recommend it to everybody, you know, because it's, uh, uh, I, I just finished a book not too long ago for uh, one of the uh, grandmasters of the Black Dragon Fighting Society, uh, Jay Blanton, uh, who was uh, uh, bullied most of his young life, basically, and, and until he was able to start taking martial arts lessons uh, when he was in high school. And we did this whole long book about all these terrible things that people did to him and, and embarrassed him and humiliated him and all these things and how people tried to stick up for him and, and, and protect him and whatnot. And none of that worked. And as he says in his book, toward one of the last chapters, because he doesn't give any details of any of the fights that he had, he just says in one of the last chapters, once they learned that I could take care of myself, they left me alone. 
And that's the, the essence of the whole bullying or anti-bullying campaign is you have to learn to stand up for yourself. Nobody can protect you. You have to do it yourself. And the same thing applies to the Jennifer Lopez movie. I've, I've had lots of, of girls that have come to me because their boyfriends were beating them up and I trained them in martial arts and this kind of thing and helped them out a few times and whatnot. But you can't save these people. They have to save themselves. And they have to, they have to learn how to stand up for themselves. And uh, that's uh, uh, one of the great things that martial arts you know, teaches you is to be empowered, you know, even if it's just a handful of sand. And uh, uh, so then you're, once you uh, realize your own self-worth and realize your own internal strength to do these things, uh, then you can you can uh, avoid a lot of trouble with bullies and people like that. Uh, and he so said the uh, the only thing, no matter there's a lot of anti-bullying campaigns right now, but the only thing a bully really understands is a punch in the mouth. I mean, you can argue with them, you know, you can negotiate with them, you can tell them this is wrong, you know, you can you can give them all kinds of behavioral things to, to study and and put him into programs and to try to rehabilitate him and stuff like this. But generally speaking. The only thing a bully understands is a punch in the mouth. And if you're willing to give it to him, most of the time you don't have to because most bullies don't want to fight either. They just want to bully people. And so uh, uh, most of the people that I've, I've talked to over the years, and, and bullies and, and victims as well, they all tell, tell me the same thing. If the guy fights back, even if he doesn't win, if he fights back, he's no longer a victim. And the bully doesn't want to pick on him anymore. He goes and finds somebody else that it's easier to deal with. And so uh, it's uh, it's just the nature of it's the nature of, of all the living things on this planet to have a pecking order, and and to have people who are the alpha dog and 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 this sort of thing, and people who will try to put themselves in that position, and so it's it's part of nature. That, that you're going to be picked on. I know people that were picked on because they were fat. I mean, I was picked on because I wore glasses. Everybody gets picked on. You have to learn how to stand up for yourself. And uh, and that's one of the lessons of of uh, of uh, you know being alive on the planet. So, sure, yeah, I, I completely agree. And we've talked about the subject of bullying on the show a few times. And I think the martial arts community on the whole is fairly unified, at least around what you're saying. You know, the the confidence instilled from having the skill, right, right, is I, I had a, about the best neutralizer. Yeah, I had a student one time who was a, a, a dwarf basically, and, has, and he also had several other medical conditions, and one of them was that his bones were so soft that he couldn't stand up on his legs, because his legs would just collapse and, and crush down on him. And so he was in a wheelchair uh, most of his life, or for all of his life, actually, and, and uh, we developed a series of techniques that he could do from the wheelchair and, and some self-defense things. And when it came time to breaking a board, which is one of the ways he developed some of this confidence, uh, I told him, I said, you don't have to do this because I know what the situation is with the calcium in your bones and stuff like that, and I don't want you to hurt yourself. So you don't have to break this board, even though it only takes eight pounds of pressure. And so he was determined to do it. And, when, and once he broke the board, you could see a change come over him. Uh, you could see that he was he was filled with, with joy and with, with uh, confidence. And about two weeks later, uh, he went to a bar, in Orlando, where I was teaching at the time, and uh, was flashing a bunch of money around, and uh, because he was wanting to get into a fight, and this guy was he was less than three feet tall, and in a wheelchair, and uh, anyway, he went out to get in his car, and uh, he had a, a Ford Maverick at the time, and the way he had to do this was he had to open the passenger side, pull out a board, put it on the wheelchair, slide across the board into the car, pull the board in reach out, grab the wheelchair, fold it up, pull it into the passenger side, close the passenger door, and then get over to the, where the pedals were, were adjusted so that he could actually reach the pedals and steer the car and whatnot. And uh, so he goes out in the parking lot, and he's starting this procedure, which takes five or six minutes. And a guy came out and tried to mug him because he'd seen him flashing all this money around. And so uh, this uh, suitor of mine told him, he says, if you want it, you got to come take it. And the guy came over, and he came up in the groin, with a, with a ridge hand strike and uh, basically and knocked the guy out. And uh, the guy was still laying in the parking lot when he drove off. And so that was one of the things he wanted. He had to test himself. He had to prove to himself that it would work. And so he deliberately set this this particular incident up. And after that, he, was, uh, he, he never came back after that uh, to class because he had 
everything he needed to 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 uh, uh, to learn from just the from the few lessons that we had together, and uh, so. And a lot of times, this is the kind of thing that that uh, uh, you run into with some other, you know, uh, students. Every once in a while, they'll learn something, and they they want to go out and try it on somebody just to see if it works. <laughs> you know, so it's uh, right. I think that's natural. You know, I think there's oh, yeah. some some human nature in there, and and I've certainly felt that pressure sure. myself. And this is what this is what sparring is supposed to be for. It's supposed to give you that that confidence that you know that you can you can prevail, you can you can win in the in the in a uh, in a fight, basically. Of course, self-defense is not really anything like sparring. But if you if you spar enough, you get that confidence that, that it doesn't matter if the other guy hits you or not. You're still going to get your technique in, and, and then you can prevail. So, which is the other thing about about ninjutsu that I studied is that it's not about winning or losing. It's about prevailing, and prevailing essentially means keeping the peace and uh, and trying not to hurt anybody. So. I like that word distinction, prevailing versus winning. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's, yeah. I think that gets pretty close to the heart of what a lot of us feel about martial arts. But I've just never heard it heard yeah. it phrased that way. I, I like that. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, so, um, well, they always they, they, there's a similar aspect of that is when when these guys will say, you know, the, the the best martial artist wins without throwing a punch, and that's you know essentially the same thing. It's you know to be able to to uh, to over to overcome the enemy without having to hit him is uh, uh, and this is, of course you get into some of these different techniques like haraki and things like that and haraki is 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 an advanced form of of uh, uh, the command voice that policemen and drill sergeants and things like that use because when people shout in your face it has a psychological effect on you and uh, and when you shout in somebody else's face then it has an effect on them. And so, of course, haraki is the idea that you can just uh, use the energy of your of the of the voice to overcome the enemy. In uh, uh, kung fu hustle, uh, there's a there's a uh, a lady who has a technique called lion's roar, and uh, and I'm sure that there must be some Chinese school that teaches it. I haven't run across one, but anyway, the idea of it is is that she could scream at such a frequency that it would knock people out and uh, and knock things over. And uh, so, uh, uh, which is a sort of what what haraki is supposed to be, and so, uh, uh, but a really good, a really good shout at the right time. A lot of times, this is where this is the beginning of this is kiai. When you start off in martial arts, and when you when you learn how to kiai, that's the idea of the kiai is to is to freeze the opponent for a second so that you can hit him. And so, right. uh, that's the the first step in learning uh, these more advanced uh, uh, lion's roar type techniques. Cool. Yeah, and certainly there's there's a lot of mythology around that, and oh, yeah. and a lot of really interesting fact. But, yeah, yeah, I've, I've seen several things on Facebook of of uh, people supposedly able to do this, and and the problem with it is when you're when you're using your your students as your as your ukis that they're going to you know be yeah. receiving this technique, they know what you want and and uh, they know what you expect, and very often they they uh, they over overplay it and so it, the technique even if it does work uh doesn't look real because the the student is trying too hard to make the teacher look good and uh, uh so and of course i've seen some of these techniques where people tried the uh, hierarchy on people that there weren't students and it, and it didn't work nearly as well so uh but it's uh, it's still it's a it's a valid technique to practice because it, it teaches your breath control and uh uh Breath control is, a, is another major part of all these martial arts techniques, because uh, in the healing arts there are a lot of breathing exercises that can be used to uh, uh, lower blood pressure and, and cure diabetes and things like this that Western medicine doesn't accept. Uh, and uh, but there are breathing techniques that can they can do a lot of good in terms of healing uh, illnesses and balancing things out. So I agree absolutely. So we just got a lot of great context for you and the martial arts and what's important to you around the martial arts. And we, we, we meandered a bit there, which is great. And I always love that because yeah. I think that gives us a better view into who we're hearing from, but I, I like, I'm sure uh, I like to use a lot of people or I've had a couple of people tell me, you know, that, that I, I, I quote movies a lot, but uh, there was a, a, a professor of anthropology named Joseph Campbell that was at William and Mary University, and he's, he's written, he wrote several books and was very well known. And uh, 
his attitude was that the, the storytellers are, are the ones that, that keep the history of the tribe alive and, and they keep the lessons that you need to learn in these different stories, uh, you know, for people to, to listen to and, and to understand and, and get the deeper meaning of the story. And one of his books was uh, called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, where he had studied a, a lot of Greek and Roman and Indian uh, mythology and he realized that the, they were all telling essentially the same story. And uh, so they were just different contexts. They were just, just different uh, uh, frameworks that these things were, were put upon uh, and different symbolism was used. But uh, essentially they all told the same story, and which was how to be a hero and how to be the hero of your own life and how to set a good example for other people and, and help your fellow man. And that's what all the major religions also teach, and, and is, uh, is how to help your fellow man and, and, uh, and to be kind. And uh, uh, so using these movies uh, is, is a good way of, of uh, expressing those, those lessons uh, in an entertaining way. Uh, uh, one of my favorite movies is, is uh, uh, The Razor's Edge, uh, and in that, the great lesson of that is, is to be kind. And... Uh, uh, so it's uh, it's a very good book uh, and a, and a, a couple of really good versions of it in the movies. So uh, uh, so like I said, but there um, and there's a lot of good symbolism. If you get a really good director, there's some really good symbolism and things in the movies too, and, and it helps to, to yeah. carry the message, you know, to you on a, on a subconscious level. So that uh, uh, it's all you know, well and good to go and, and see Star Wars and 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 see how these heroes behave. Because then you try to be like those people, and you become a better person. And so, uh, and even though there's not that much uh, action and adventure in, in The Razor's Edge, uh, it still teaches you a lot of very valuable lessons in terms of how to how to deal with people and and uh, and how to uh, how to live a good life and how to be a good person. And uh, so, and I think that's what everybody really would like to be able to do. It's just that uh, because of uh, economics and and uh, politics and, and uh, princes imposing their will on people, uh, it's, it's not as easy as it sounds sometimes. No, it's, it's unfortunately not. Yeah. Well, I do believe, though, that there's, there's a big awakening that's, that's coming. Uh, you know, I mean, they, they've been predicting doom and gloom ever since I was a kid. When I was a kid, you know, the Russians were going to destroy us all with nuclear war. And then after that, it was you know there was going to be another apocalypse, and there's and there's going to be an apocalypse in 20, 2000, and then there was going to be an apocalypse in twenty twelve, and it there's the apocalypse is happening all the time. Okay, it just doesn't happen very fast like all these people think it's it's happening because the world is changing and people are changing, and eventually, uh, if you if you watch the the political scene now, everybody is waking up to the idea that the system is pretty corrupt. That, that it doesn't matter if, if, if you know what you do. If you're in one of the privileged few, you can get away with anything. And if you're not one of the privileged few, you're going to be set upon all the time, and you're going to be harassed all the time. And you got to learn to to fight back against that. And people are slowly starting to to come to this realization that that uh, that it's not quite like it is on TV. They, there's a there's a million police shows on TV about how these guys go to extraordinary lengths to get justice. And it's that's TV. That's not the way it is in real life. In real life, it's a lot harder to get justice. And even if you have people that are really trying as hard as they can, they still can't get justice sometimes. So it's uh, uh, so it's part of the uh, propaganda machine. It's part of, of keeping everybody either scared to death or or uh, uh, or in poverty, so that they they just do what they're told instead of learning how to think for themselves. And this is part of the education system. Uh, that we've had too for such a long time. They've changed history so many times. It's not at all what they taught me when I was in school, and so it's and it's and it's not most of it's not true anymore. And so it's uh, it's unfortunate that uh, that people don't have heroes. I mean, when I was growing up, there was a Lone Ranger, Roy Rogers, John Wayne. You know, all these people were were ex- examples of how we should behave and and how we should deal with other people. And uh, now. All of these characters have been, in some way, discredited over the years, and uh, uh, like Thomas Jefferson, you know, and George Washington, they have been discredited because they made beer. Well, everybody made beer back in those days, and so it wasn't a big crime. And so it's it's uh, but by 
by finding ways to bring down the heroes, you break down the culture. And this is something that Sun Tzu said in, in his uh, treatise on war in, the, in like 6000 BC, was, you know, that, that uh, you, you can destroy the country from within, you don't have to invade it. And one of the ways of doing that is to break down the institutions and discredit all of the, all of the leaders, even the ones that were in the past. And so uh, that's why it's important now to have heroes that, that people can want to be like. Uh, and in most of the movies even nowadays, you, you don't see that sort of thing. I mean, the, the Batman and Superman movies, these characters have so much angst. They're, they're constantly wondering, did I do the right thing? Should I do the right thing? Is that the right thing? And the original Superman and Batman knew what the right thing was, and they did the right thing, and everybody followed their example. And uh, uh, so that's why it is, it's, it's important to have heroes, and right now we don't have a lot of them. It's uh, at least not in, over here. So uh, maybe in, in Europe and some of these other places. In China, they've got one guy named Wong Fei Hung, who was the most famous boxer in China, and he was a doctor. He didn't go out. He didn't. He only taught martial arts to a very few people, but could, because he was primarily a doctor. But nobody could beat him. And uh, it's very similar to the guy that uh, Jet Li played in, in Fearless, uh, Hu Jinhua, who was another famous martial artist. And, and uh, in, in the in the movie Fearless, uh, there's a, a scene where he comes to this realization <clears throat> of that he doesn't have to to kill his opponent. And he understands finally why his father, who was also a martial artist, gave up fighting for money and gave up fighting in tournaments because he didn't want to hurt people anymore. And so, and then, uh, then Hu Jinhua basically did a lot to restore uh, national pride in China uh, because this was he was around during the period when... Uh, uh, the Japanese were invading Manchuria and this kind of thing, and there was a lot of strife going on over there. But he helped to restore the Chinese national pride by being able to defeat anybody they put in the ring against him and and not hurt them, just prevail against them and show that the Chinese systems were good systems and that then they were effective and they would work. You just had to be really good at it. And, uh, and so he was quite a, a famous hero also. So it's... Uh, <clears throat> Like I said, it's to have historical characters like that that you can you can look up to and and uh, uh, and follow and try to be like. Yeah. Let's talk about competition for a second. You know, we've, okay. that's kind of threaded through a little bit. What's your experience? Have you spent much time as a competitor? Uh, Was that ever I've been, part of your training? I've been to a few tournaments. Uh, <clears throat> I've been in a few. <clears throat> excuse me, a few. Uh, uh, fights for money and things like this, and uh, uh, there's a lot of politics at most of the most of the tournaments uh, that you go to, um, and very often the person putting the tournament on, most of his people tend to win because he picks the judges and and they they're all his friends and they've all been invited there and this kind of thing. It's not necessarily an, an evil plot, but it's just a, a tendency that you happen to notice. And sometimes you get certain prejudices. Uh, one time uh, we had a school in, in uh, Central Florida, and they were having the uh, Tampa Bay Open, which was a uh, open competition for anybody that wanted to come over. And uh, there was about a thousand people there, if I, if I remember correctly. And uh, uh, there were some big name uh, martial artists there. One of them was a guy named John Pacific, uh, or Pacific, I think from uh, he was from Miami, uh, and he was like the father of Florida martial arts. And uh, during the, uh, I decided that I would get into the uh, kata competition. And uh, so in the hard style kata competition, like 35 people competing. And uh, uh, so it took quite a long time to get through everybody. And when it got to be my turn, I went up and I introduced myself and I told them that I was going to do kata Dante. And uh, uh, John Tchevich, uh looked at me and he says, he says uh, you mean mate? And I went, yes because I knew that he wouldn't let me do the kata if, if he knew what it was really going to be. And so uh, I, he said, okay. So I stepped back, and uh, I did a little bow, and then I did uh, the kata that I learned from Count Dante up in Chicago in 68. I did 27 moves in five seconds. And uh, I did, it was so fast that one of the judges looked away and didn't even see it, so he couldn't give me a, a score on it. And uh, so then they called me back up to the... To the uh, judging line there and, and, uh, and asked me what that kata was. And I said, it was kata Dante. 
And they said, do you know who invented that con? And I said, yes, sir, John Keehan in, in Chicago. And uh, they uh, gave me very low grades on the, on the form, first because it was unlike anything anybody else did. Everybody else was doing long, long cottage like uh, uh, Bass I-1 modified and with the head flying kicks in it and all this kind of thing. And some of these forms would last two or three minutes, and mine only lasted five seconds. And so, plus they didn't like Count Dante. There was a lot of prejudice against Count Dante. And so anybody who was doing his system was automatically not as uh, well thought of as, uh, as the uh, other competitors. And so uh, I got very low points on, on that one. I, I didn't get a trophy for it. But I had a really good time. And a lot of people came up to me afterwards and asked me, you know, where I had learned that and could they study it. Uh, another tournament I went to in Central Florida, I did my uh, hand in the steel trap trick, and uh, uh, which is an iron hand technique, and uh, went up and uh, told them I was going to demonstrate the iron hand of ninjutsu. This is a number four steel trap. I set the trap and I put a pencil in it, snapped the pencil right in half, and I said, now, a pencil is about the same size as the bones in your fingers. And so I set the trap again, and I did a breathing exercise, and I put my hand in the trap, and it slammed shut on my fingers, and I held it up, and I set it back down, opened the trap up, took my hand out, shook my fingers to show that there was, I was okay. And so, uh, once again, because it was so unusual, there were like other people doing both staff katas and nunchukas and things like this, and they all scored pretty high, but because nobody had ever seen anybody put a hand in a, in a trap before, they didn't give me very good marks for it. So, uh, when I, but when I turned around to leave and to go back into the, into the uh, dressing room to change and uh, head out, uh, the whole place kind of parted like the Red Sea. And, and I had <laughs> several people come up and ask me afterwards, you know, where, where was I training or where, where could they come and study to learn that kind of thing? And so... Um, so I said some unusual experiences. Um, uh, I said, uh, uh, one time uh, I was at a school. We were invited to uh, do some uh, sparring at a, at a Taekwondo school. And uh, we were doing, me and three or four of my students there, we were all having a pretty good time. And uh, I was sparring with the sensei at one point, And uh, uh, he threw a really high uh, sidekick. And I was able to get under the kick. And I, I caught him in his platform leg and, and knocked him over. And, of course, I knew that was the wrong thing to do because this is his school, and you don't want to make the teacher look bad at his own school. So I figured I'd have to give him the next point. And uh, sure enough, he was he knew what was going on, too. And so uh, the next time we engaged, uh, he took, took a back leg trip on me, and when I hit the ground, he came down with a, a stomp kick you know, right next to my head to show that, yes, you know, he could take me out if he wanted to. And, of course, I complimented him on it, and we sparred a little bit more. you know. But the thing was, was we restored his respect from his students by letting him uh, prove that, that my kick was a lucky kick and that his kick was a serious and, and intended technique. And so, um, so like I said, things like that, you know, happen in, in these uh, 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 things that, uh, like uh, the way I got my, my uh, nickname was, was Ashita was uh, at a term that we were uh, at when I was in the Shotokan school. And, uh, I like to kick a lot more than most of the other Shotokan guys did because Shotokan is mostly a, a hand-based boxing-type system. And so uh, uh, at any rate, at one point, uh, when, I, when they called Hajime, the, my opponent stepped up and, and put a score to point on me right away. And so uh, uh, I felt a little bit embarrassed about it. And so uh, when we set up for the second uh, beginning, uh, when the uh, referee called uh, for us to begin, uh, I did a spinning back kick, and I kind of caught him in the chin. And uh, usually I don't throw that kick any higher than waist level because it's, it's much better balance if you only throw it about at the stomach. But this particular time, they said I managed to catch him under the chin. And it, it didn't knock him out, <clears throat> but it stunned him pretty well, and it chipped one of his teeth. And so, because uh, uh, at that time we weren't wearing any safety gear. At that time there wasn't any safety gear except kendo armor. And, uh, and we weren't using that for this particular tournament. But uh, at any rate, after that, they, everybody started calling me Bigfoot because I was uh, I kicked a lot, and uh, that's where uh, I picked <laughs> up the, the name Ashita because uh, Ashi means foot, and Da means big, and so that was uh, how I got that particular nickname. But uh, <laughs> uh, like I said, this tournament competition is, is uh, you know a, a very subjective sort of a, of a of a fight. 
uh, I was at a tournament up in, in Pennsylvania one time, and uh, it was supposed to be light contact. And so uh, I, was, I was judging this one uh, ring, and uh, one of the uh, competitors kicked the other one in the stomach. And uh, nobody gave him a point for it because he hit the guy too hard. And one of the and the referee actually told him, you know, that's too too much contact. So a couple minutes later, he did it again and he hit the guy a little bit harder. And I was the only one that was in a position to give him a point for it, and I didn't give him a point because it was too hard of a technique. And I told him again, this is too hard of a technique. It's supposed to be light contact. So the third time this happened, and I refused to give him a point, he got pissed off and, and walked off the floor. And I didn't care because he was not going by the established rules that everybody had agreed to. It's not supposed to be kill your opponent or, or you know, rupture him or, or knock his teeth out. It's supposed to be right. light contact. That's how you get the point. And so, like I said, it's, uh, 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 a lot of times that kind of thing happens at tournaments. And uh, There's a very good movie uh, called uh, uh, Circle of Iron. It's sometimes called The Silent Flute. And it's, it's from a, a story that Bruce Lee wrote. And at the beginning of the movie, the same sort of thing happens. The hero is at a tournament uh, trying to win a medallion so that he can go in and, and meet Zetan, uh, who is the keeper of the Book of Enlightenment, and find out, or get enlightenment, basically. And uh, during the competition, he knocks his opponent down and knocks him out. And, of course, he's disqualified because it's, that's not allowed in this competition. And so this is one of the ways that Bruce Lee was able to, to get all the martial artists to empathize with the hero and, and get into the movie and, and play the movie from the hero's point of view. Because almost everybody has been to a tournament where they felt like they got cheated. They didn't get points for a, a technique that they threw or the other guy got a lucky hit and, and defeated him and, and uh, it wasn't a real fair fight. And so everybody has been in that stage or been in that, in that uh, 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 state of mind where they felt like they got cheated at a tournament. And so uh, that's, like I said, one of, the, one of the tricks that Bruce Lee used to get people into his story, basically, in that particular movie. It's an excellent movie if you ever get a chance to see it. Uh, uh, it's pretty seldom shown on TV, or, and I, I don't think it enjoyed a very wide release uh, in, in the theaters either. But it's, it's available if you just have to track it down. And it, okay. it, has, it has so many great lessons in it, because uh, uh, I'm sure you've seen uh, Return of the Dragon with Bruce Lee when he was fighting Chuck Norris in the Coliseum. And course, uh, yeah. at one point in that fight, that when they start off, they're using basic techniques, and they one guy one guy scores, the other guy scores. It's kind of a back and forth battle. And then when Chuck Norris starts to win a little bit, Bruce Lee realizes he's going to have to fight harder, so he starts dancing. He starts bouncing up and down on his, on his toes like a boxer. And then every time Chuck Norris comes in, Bruce Lee hits him on the beat, just as if he was still dancing. And Chuck Norris not going with the beat, of course, is vulnerable to this particular attack. And this is what Bruce Lee is trying to tell you is to use rhythm and timing as part of, as one of your weapons and your, not just, you know, punching and kicking. Rhythm and timing and speed are part of this. And so when Chuck Norris uh, starts to accept the rhythm and starts to bounce up and down on, on his toes and, and try to throw boxing techniques, then Bruce Lee hits him on the half beat, which is what he learned by, by being a cha-cha champion, and which is, has uh, a an extra beat in it, basically, for a half beat. And so, and eventually he wins that fight. In Circle of Iron, he expressed the same thing, because there was one of the people that the hero had to fight was called the Rhythm Man. And the Rhythm Man uh, had a little circus that he uh, ran most of the time. Whenever he sparred with anybody, he would always have his, his band, basically, playing these musical instruments all around him. And he was not even fighting. He was just dancing. But because his opponent most of the time, didn't know how to use rhythm, uh, he was able to defeat him because he was able to hit him on the beat and use rhythm and timing to, to land his punches uh, when the, and the opponent couldn't. And so this is one of the things that Bruce Lee was trying to teach us with these movies, uh, not only the one that he wrote, but also the one that he was in with Chuck Norris, that in the sense that uh, rhythm and timing and speed are, are very important parts of everything that you do. And very often, in the, especially in the commercial martial arts schools, you have to develop that on your own. They don't really, they don't really make a big point of teaching you rhythm or timing. And uh, oh, time, the timing comes in when you're doing one steps. But essentially, the the technique of using rhythm is one that you you either develop on your own or you pick it up somewhere outside of the martial arts school. Because uh, most martial arts schools, at least the ones that I visited, don't 
stress that sort of thing. Uh, they 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 concentrate mostly on on uh, blocking and punching and, and counterattacking. So yeah, uh, I would I would agree. And I'll see if I can track down the links to that movie, and we'll oh, post yeah. it just like we do everything else over at the show notes for anyone that's new to the show. Right. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Right, right. Yeah, and it's, it's it is available. Uh, it's uh, and it's an excellent movie. Uh, it's got a it's got a lot of really good lessons in it, uh, and a lot of good. Uh, hidden techniques in it, and uh, uh, I mean, I could, you know, I could talk all day just on the movie because it's got so many great things in it. I've watched it a thousand times because every time I have a, a student come and train with me, I, I make them watch that movie so that they can get into the into the mindset that Bruce Lee had about some of these things, mm-hmm. and and uh, and get some of these hidden lessons that that are uh, uh, that are easily observable in the movie. But it would take a long time to explain and, and a long time to develop over uh, if you didn't understand the principle itself. So it's uh, uh, because, like I said, so there's a lot of good you know stories along those lines, and, and uh, uh, it's just a, a question of, of uh, uh, the example that you want to present, so that the uh, because one of the other things in this movie, in the beginning of the movie, uh, the hero. Uh, berates one of the other competitors, and he says, "He's just a dancer. I'm a fighter." And at the end of the movie, his best friend is a dancer, and so mm-hmm. he's also a martial artist. And so uh, he learns to overcome his his prejudice, and he learns to to accept people the way they are, and appreciate what they can do, even though it's not exactly the same thing he's doing. This is one of the problems you get into with a lot of martial arts: is they they feel like my style is the only style that's any good. Everybody else's style is no good. Cross training is evil. This kind of stuff, but cross training is the best way to learn. You pick up techniques from everywhere, and uh, I've got a lot of good techniques that I've, I picked up from watching basketball and football. Because when you're hmm. when you fake the guy out of position so that you can go around him with a basketball, or you you do a spin move so that the guy can't tackle you, that's ninjutsu. That's invisibility. That's being able to to not be hit, and and to not have to hit the other guy. And so uh, all these sports have have uh, uh, you know, excellent uh, uh, techniques like that. That uh, you just have to look for them a little bit and and uh, uh, and you know see how they can be applied to to what you're doing. And so, like I said, most martial arts don't teach you to avoid these techniques or to avoid the punches. They teach you to block them and and or slip them and throw a counterattack. But uh, like I said, in the gist of the idea is to not get hit at all if you can help it. And uh, and only and wait until there's an opening before you try to hit the other guy. And so Makes uh, it's uh, yeah, it's self defense basically when you come right down to it. Right. So as we start to wind down here, let's talk a little bit more about you and, and you specifically. I, you have some books, if I remember. Uh, um, yeah, I have quite a few. Uh, back in the '80s, I wrote uh, about a dozen or so for uh, a publisher out in Colorado, and uh, I was over in Australia. And I had a guy ask me, <clears throat> what did I think of the new Ninja training manual that had just come out? And I said, well, I haven't seen it. And so he brought me a copy of it, and I looked at it, and I, this is one of my books. It just has a different cover on it. This is this is the original book of the Ninja. It just got Ninja training manual in front of it instead. So when I came back, I contacted the publisher, and I found out that there were a whole bunch of these books that were uh, being uh, sold under other titles and, and, uh, and sold all over the world, basically. Uh, at one point, they told me that they had translated a bunch of these books into into Portuguese for Brazil and into German and, and Fran- French and, and uh, Spanish and different things like that. And uh, they told me at one point they had actually translated some of my books to, into Japanese. Uh, and I asked them to send me a couple of copies, and then they denied that they had translated it into Japanese. And uh, then I found out that all these overseas sales were not being credited to me. They were going to some literary agent. And so that, I broke away from that particular publisher and, and started self-publishing. And uh, now we've got uh, about 250 books or so on, on Dojo Press. Not all of them, of course, are mine, but because uh, I've got a lot of good, really good friends that I've helped put these books together uh, with, and videos from some of these other people too. And uh, uh, we don't promote as much as Amazon does or some of these other big people because it's, to me, it's more of a hobby. Than anything else to to have these books out there and make them available to people. Um, uh, I mean, I certainly it wouldn't mind having a massive number of sales and, and being rich. <laughs> right. But uh, but basically, the, to me, it's more important that that the information is available and to the people that that look for it. 
Uh, not, instead of trying to sell people something, I let them come and find it, and then it, it means more to them that way, and they get more out of it that way. But uh, I had a lady not too long ago uh, who uh, uh, has been to a couple of our uh, Black Dragon gatherings, and uh, she's been writing to me for the last couple of months talking about how she is rereading Secrets of the Ninja, which is one of the first ones that I published, and how she's finding so much hidden technique in that book that she didn't realize before and comparing it, a lot of these things to uh, the Tai Chi and things like that that she, she's doing uh, now because uh, that she's evolved to that level where she's practicing Tai Chi primarily now. And, uh, for instance, in the Kujikiri techniques, there's a, a, a position where you form a triangle between your index finger and your thumbs and you extend your fingers. And, uh, uh, and this is uh, a technique of... Uh, called uh, uh, Control of the Elements, basically, because each one of the fingers represents one of the five elements. And there's a lot of meditation things that you can do with that. And she was asking me if this is not, in fact, the same hand position that you find uh, in one of the Tai Chi forms, or several of the Tai Chi forms, where you flash your fingers in the opponent's face to make him blink so that you can hit him. And I went, certainly. That's, it's exactly the same technique, and that is one of the techniques to just teach in ninjutsu, it comes from the meditation part, is the idea of being able to flash your fingers in the guy's face to make him blink. And uh, they only have to close their eyes for a half a second, and you can be gone. And uh, Or you can drop down and do a real low leg sweep and knock your feet out of under him. So there's uh, the idea of, of uh, using a distraction as your initial technique or using something that's going to make the guy blink as, as, a, as your first technique is, to me, is what qualifies these things as, as invisibility and, and ninjutsu. So, hmm. and like I said, that can be learned by anybody for a short period of time. What other, I mean, for, for people that might be interested in checking out the books that you have available at, at Dojo Press, I assume that's dojopress.com? Yes. Yeah. Okay, at dojopress.com. You know, 250 is a lot, so we're certainly not going to go down through a list, but uh, what kind of books are people going to find? Obviously, martial arts, but... Uh, well, we've got uh, like I said, we've got all the ones that I originally wrote: uh, Secrets of Invisibility, uh, Ninja Death Touch, uh, Ninja Mind Control. Ninja Mind Control is one of the best ones uh, available. It's it's actually uh, still being sold uh, in other uh, under other under other titles overseas and in other translations and stuff. But it's it has a very good uh, explanation of the of the uh, meditation techniques and the Kujikiri techniques, and, and it doesn't go into a lot of elaborate detail about what you can do with these techniques. Because once you start practicing them, you discover what you can do with them, and you discover exactly how they're used and this kind of thing, and, and why they're in the particular pattern that they are. The uh, I've got you know a couple of books on the, the Lady Ninjas, uh, uh, Kunoichi and the Dragon Ladies, and things like that, and some grappling books and whatnot. Uh, but the one that we published a couple of years ago uh, that I'm very proud of is the Healing Hands of the Ninja, which is a big eight and a half by eleven book, uh, and it has a lot of techniques that are that are what we call energy work. Uh, every punch that you do has what they call a build to it, where you you, char- you charge up your hand or you charge up your body with this energy, and then when you hit the te- hit the, the target or the opponent, then you transmit that energy you know to the opponent, and uh, and it doubles the effect of your technique and whatnot. And the same energy can be used to heal people. And so this particular book has uh, 25 or 30 different techniques where you can, that you can use to build energy up and draw energy to your hands so that you can use your hands to, to um, uh, correct imbalances and, and to heal things uh, and help people out and, and help people to, to, to feel better and, and, and be healthy and develop longevity. Uh, but uh, this is very similar to uh, uh, Reiki techniques. Uh, they have a particular... Uh, uh, system that they use to to draw energy to their hands, so that they can then use this energy to to help people uh, uh, with different energy imbalances. And uh, uh, this particular book, like I said, has a greater variety of, of techniques that you can use to charge your hands up. And this is the kind of thing. There's a, there's a, another one we did for Grandmaster Day called the Tibetan Burning Palm. And this technique is a breathing exercise. It takes about 15 or 20 minutes to, to do it. But when you get done, your hands are, are energized. And this is the technique that you use to break the bottom brick and uh, uh, and this sort of thing when you're doing breaking techniques and break other bricks. I mean, we have a great picture of, of Grandmaster Day breaking 13 concrete slabs with his, with his hands. And uh, so it's... Uh, 
And the, the way you do that without hurting your hand is to put chi or energy on your hand so that it's like a, an armored glove. And then uh, when you hit something with it, it doesn't hurt you. It's the same thing as putting your hand in the trap. It doesn't hurt you. It hurts the other person. And uh, mm. so it's, uh, uh, like I said, the, the ener- doing the energy techniques is, is uh, where I've evolved to a lot more now. And, and even though I don't have a, a clinic or anything that I'm doing myself, I like to try to share those things with people now, and, and we have several books that are on good health and longevity also. And uh, then, of course, there are other uh, other authors that have their own versions of uh, ninjutsu and, and have basic techniques and, and uh, meditation exercises. And, uh, we've got quite a bit of uh, uh, people that have done sword techniques also and, uh, uh, and various other weapons. And so um, there's some, uh, some pretty good a pretty good selection of things on there, depending on, on what sort of techniques you're looking for. Yeah, it sounds pretty diverse. Yeah, well, we tried to, over the years, we started out with just basically the first 12 that I did and uh, uh, and worked up from there. And, uh, uh, you know, over the years, we managed to, to pick up other people that wanted to include their books into the um, into the catalog, and, and we've helped some of them do that, and some of them, uh, you know, we just did the books and let them publish them themselves and whatnot. But uh, that's the great thing about nowadays. You can, you can self-publish and, uh, uh, and get the word out there to people. So Great. So as we start to wind down here, I mean, you've shared a lot of amazing stuff, some really great stuff, and I appreciate all the stories that you've given us today. And I think we're going to have to have you back on. Uh, listener, long-time yeah. listeners will know that we got to uh, m- maybe half of the questions, depending on how we want to look at it. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's great. I mean, I, I love I love when we get to wander on the show. I think that's where the best stuff comes out. Well, but we always. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, I I greatly enjoy it myself. I mean, I I love you know talking about martial arts and, and sharing the stories and the techniques with people, and and so and I'd be you know glad to come back anytime. Oh, fantastic! But let's end the way we always like to end with a bit of advice. If you had some advice to offer to everyone listening, what would you say? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I would have to say that my, my primary piece of advice is, is to be kind and to try to help other people and, uh, and then stand up for yourself and, and get, gain self-knowledge so that you, you have a sense of your own value and, and a sense of your own self-worth. There's uh not to be quoted out of the movie, but in, in Conan the Barbarian, there's a, there's a scene where after uh, Conan has, has beaten Ten or twelve opponents in the in the uh, in the pit fighting that they did, and killed them. Of course, there the the narrator makes the remark. He came to realize his own self worth, and if you realize that, if you if you realize that you're a, you're a human being and that you're a child of the universe and that you have an important part to play in in the universe and in the world, then it makes you want to be a better person. And uh, and the key to that is to be kind, because if if you're kind, then uh, people will love to see you coming. If you're a bully, nobody wants to be around you. But if you're, except your cronies, basically. <laughs> but right, if you're, right. if you're kind and if if you help people, uh, then uh, then they'll be glad to see you. And, and then it'll be like one of these other jiu-jitsu schools say: wherever I go, people are safer. You know? And wherever I am, people have a friend. And uh, so it's uh, uh, it's not a really a matter of making a, a big show. I was telling a friend of mine the other day that that. Uh, I have a lot of T-shirts that people have given me over the years, uh, martial arts T-shirts and, and clubs and things like that. I very seldom wear anything that has a, a, a logo or a, or a sales pitch on it for anything. And this is this is one of the subliminal parts of ninjutsu is the idea of, of not attracting attention. Just when the time comes, you step up and you do what has to be done because it's just like John Kennedy said, we do the hard things not because we want to. But because they have to be done, and and uh, that's what uh, martial arts has taught me really is is to be able to do what has to be done, and uh, and to you know and to be kind to other people. Thank you for listening to episode 104 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and thank you to Sensei Kim. Over at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com, you can find links to Sensei Kim's books, his websites, and a lot more. If you like the show, be sure you're subscribing or using one of our free apps. They're available on both iOS and Android. For those of you kind enough to leave us a review, remember, we randomly check out the podcast review sites, and if we find your review there, 
We'll mention it on the air. And then you can go ahead and email us. We'll send you a free pack of Whistle Kick stuff with a t-shirt and some other fun things. If you know someone that would be a great interview for the show, please fill out the form at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Or if you want to suggest a topic for a Thursday show or give us some other feedback, there's a form for that as well. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram. And our username is always Whistlekick. Remember the products you can find at whistlekick.com or on Amazon, like our t-shirts and our sparring gear. If you're a school owner or a team coach, you should check out wholesale.whistlekick.com for a discounted wholesale program. We'll be back soon, but until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.